Welcome! You are listening to Audio from the Table. If you'd like to learn more about our community or donate to this ministry, please visit thetabletx.com. All right. This side is chatty. We got all the chattiness over here. Awesome. Well, it is, uh, it's so good to be with you all. My name is Brett, and um, grace and peace. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I want to mention before I bring up Sally, um, next week we're starting a new series uh, titled The Bible Doesn't Say That. And it'll be those, you know, little turns of phrase that it's sort of in the culture, and everyone just assumes, like, oh, that's, that's you know, the good Lord said that in the... Uh, Second Opinions, chapter 7, verse 2, you know, so it's in there somewhere, you know, and sure enough, it's not, you know, I don't know, just everything from like, uh, everything happens for a reason, you know, um, just let go and let God, you know, there's sort of all, all of these that are floating around, so um, we'll be kind of unpacking those, so um, I encourage you to, to be with us next week. Um, all right, the wonderful Sally Gary, so come on up, can y'all give her a hand? <laughs> So, Sally, I'm not going to take up her time, but I just want to say we are so glad to have you. Um, for those who don't know Sally, she started an um, organization called Centerpiece and is really working to not only be kind of an ally and a support to um, LGBTQ people in the church, but really a, a bridge builder. Um, this is not a, a woman who is out to, like, I don't know, condemn people or like people who disagree with her. So, you know, like that's just not her spirit. She, and you'll see that in the whole message, just she is about love and, um, and that bridge building, that conversation, like can we just talk like human beings? Seems we've lost that capacity uh, in the last 10 years or so in this country <laughs> uh, and in the church too, sadly. Um, so all that to say, she is um, in many ways a spiritual mother to many here. Um, certainly she's been that, um, for me and, uh, I just, I really appreciate who she is. So mm. Sally, mm. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brett, for the introduction and even more for the invitation to come and be with all of you. I, I feel like the table is part my family anyway, my goodness, connections with Marissa and Don and, and Raymond and met Brett and Maggie uh, a while back. But I have to tell you that you all endeared yourselves to me. Your band endeared yourselves to me last November when we were planning a big conference at Wilshire Baptist. And I had had a band lined up for that conference for a year and a half a signed contract and everything was good and all of a sudden it was three weeks before the conference and it was not good and they decided not to come and I called Brett and I said we got to have a band <laughs> and Maggie came to our rescue thank you thank you so so much I, I tell you what, it, uh, it just made all the difference in the entire uh, conference. It, it was just a, a different, it was a different space. Did I get y'all mixed up? Yeah. Maggie's back here. You're Mindy. She was in charge, but Mindy was in charge. Mindy's not, Mindy and Ma well, well, whoever it was, whichever one of you. <laughs> Seriously, aren't they just incredible? <laughs> I, I mean that sincerely. And the, and the next to the last song that we sang for everyone born, that was a song I, I requested. And I said, we have to have this song because I, I just think it fits. Our, our theme was a place at the table, and so the words were just perfect. And in three weeks' time, boom, it was beautiful. 500 people from all over the country, another 100 people online were able to worship with y'all. 
and be reconnected to God. People who hadn't been in a very long time. That's the beauty of what we get to do. And I can't wait to tell you more about that. I brought you a little present from Centerpiece. Little Jesus Loves You sticker. That's where I'll begin because there's never been a time in my life that I did not know that. I can't remember a time when I didn't know who Jesus is. That's a greater blessing with every year that passes, right? I didn't realize. I grew up in a little bitty town. Well, not really little bitty, but in comparison to Dallas. Wichita Falls on the Oklahoma border, just north of here. Back in the 60s and 70s, and my mom and dad were the biggest workers in the church, right? I, I was that kid of, of those parents, and we were that family. We were there, as we say, every time the doors were open, right? Those of you who are older, you, you recognize this as a, a good old Olin Mills church directory picture. <laughs> If you grew up in church at all, back in the 60s and 70s, your family took a picture like this, and, and that's how you learned who everybody was. I can remember, I can remember selling uh, everything from campfire, remember camp, anybody remember campfire girls? I was a campfire girl, or, or band candy when it came time, you know, fall band candy season to raise money. I would get out the church directory and I would go through and I would mark off the names, and I would ask my mom, can I call these people? And she would say, yes, because she taught me that those people that we sat in the pews with every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night and every night of the week when there was a gospel meeting or a week in the summer for VBS or another week for church camp, whatever it was we were involved, those people were my family. Those were the people who showed me the love of Jesus, right? I was Dan and Betty's little girl. And so everywhere I went in that building that I knew like the back of my hand, I knew it as well as I knew the house that I grew up in. Every nook and cranny where they kept the communion grape juice. <laughs> that was my home. And those people were my family. As I was growing up, though, I, I, learned, I learned to keep secrets. Because as sweet as this family is that you see in this picture, there were things that happened at home that we didn't talk about. My father did not grow up in a Christian home. He grew up in what we would now call uh, an abusive home. He had no idea how to be a Christian husband and father. In the 60s and 70s, we had no idea how to talk about stuff in ways that we are learning now. And so his anger would turn to rage which would end in silence, and for weeks at a time, my mother and I would converse and talk, and my father would be there but live in silence. And we never talked about that. I never expressed the extreme fear that I felt for my dad growing up. We just tucked that away, and, and sooner or later, things would roll around, and it would get back to normal, and we ate dinner every night together, and we went on vacations, and we went to church together, and we sometimes played catch in the backyard, and then, boom, the cycle would begin again. And that's how I grew up. But I was at church, 
and I was involved and I was listening. I was soaking in who Jesus is. And at a very early age, I loved Jesus. The picture of God that I got from my mom, especially, that consistency that she demonstrated, that unconditional love that no matter what I said or did or how I acted, it was always the same and you could depend and feel secure and you felt compassion and comfort. It showed me a picture of God that has stayed with me to this day. For that, I am eternally grateful. That is how I came to see God. And yet we kept these secrets, right? And I go to school. My father has just acted abhorrently the night before, and I get up and I go to school, and I am the perfect kid at school, and I make perfect grades, and, and I learn pretty early, oh, Sally, you can be funny, and you can make jokes, and you've got a good sense of humor, and so you can keep everybody kind of right here and make them think everything's just hunky-dory, because you can make them laugh. And I lived life that way. And all of that was real, but there was a lot of other stuff going on that I didn't even have a clue as a child that we really needed to work through. By middle school, I began to realize there is something different about you, Sally. There's something different. Maybe the clothes you want to wear uh, how you want to dress. Well, maybe you're just a tomboy. Now, I didn't like climbing trees, and I didn't like anything athletic, so it just all didn't fit, right? <laughs> I was really an anomaly. I just knew there was something different. And there was a little boy that I liked in seventh grade and went to the band banquet with him in the eighth grade, and we dated off and on through high school, remain dear friends to this day. He's an attorney here in Dallas who's gay. <laughs> Sweetest guy. When I got to college, I went to uh, Christian University, Abilene Christian University out in West Texas. Same thing, you know, I'm the good kid, I'm the kid that you can depend on, I'm the kid that gets up with her roommates and we're at church every Sunday. We're involved, we're teaching classes if you need us to. And yet, by my junior year, I realized, oh, Sally, you have finally figured out what all the songs on the radio are about, and your feelings for your best friend go a lot deeper than friendship. I had no idea. Now keep in mind, it's the early 80s, and there was no conversation in the secular world. There was still, uh, at, at least in North Texas, West Texas, uh, towns the size of Abilene and Wichita Falls, there was no conversation about being gay. That was still a bad word. It meant you were promiscuous. Well, that didn't describe me. I was not. But I knew that I was head over heels in love with my best friend and roommate at the time, who was a girl. She had no clue. She had no clue. And I had no idea what to do with that. I'm at a Christian university. I am surrounded by some of the sweetest, most wonderful mentors I've ever had in this life. And yet I didn't feel safe to say anything. Because I'd heard the stories, right? I'd heard the jokes. I'd heard the slurs about other people, right? This can't be you, Sally. Yes, honey, it is. And so I kept that to myself. 
I didn't say a word. I begged God day after day after day after day after day for another 15 years to take those feelings away. I went through graduate school. I taught high school speech and debate for 10 years. You kind of lose your mind after teaching high school kids for 10 years, right? <laughs> and it was then that I thought, oh, I'll go to law school. Because you see, I'm still keeping secrets. I'm keeping secrets about dad. And now I'm keeping secrets about me. And the shame that I carry. How in the world did this happen to you, Sally? Don't you know? Don't people know you're the good little Church of Christ girl? How can this happen to you? I carried all that completely by myself, except for God. Because I believed what that sticker says. Even then, there was nothing I could do that would separate me from the love of God. I had no idea what to do with myself or my life or what would become of me. I just kept going, and I thought if I just work more and study more and learn more and get this degree and then that degree, and maybe we'll try a whole new thing. We'll practice law. The Lord brings a lot of people to their knees in law school. And he did me, too. It was in that second year, that first semester, that I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't continue doing this by myself. And so I thought one night, I'll just sit down and I'll write a letter to God, okay? I'll name it. I'll call it what it is. I'll even use the H word. I'll say it. I'll write it out to you, God, and surely that's going to be good enough, right? No, honey. God always calls me honey. I could almost hear him literally say, I, I want you to tell somebody. I don't want you to carry this by yourself anymore. I was 35 years old. I was up all night. I tore that letter in little bitty pieces. I snuck out in the dead of night I, in my apartment complex. I took it to two different trash dumpsters. <laughs> That's the level of shame and paranoia that I felt. I know my LGBTQ siblings understand what I felt. I know you do. Nobody should ever have to carry that by themselves. I got up the next morning, I made a phone call, and I ended up driving from Lubbock. I was at Texas Tech Law School at the time. I, I drove from Lubbock to Dallas because God knows I couldn't see somebody at the church that I was going to at the time that I was a faithful member of. I had to go someplace far, far away where nobody would know, right? And I ended up flying once a week for the duration of law school from Lubbock to Dallas to talk to this guy because when I first came out to him, he, he didn't turned me away, he simply said, can you come back and talk some more? And so I did. He knew I didn't need to hear Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6. He knew I knew all those verses. He just invited me to come and talk more, and so I did. And I began to talk about the first secret that I was carrying You know, back in the late 90s, the big Christian belief was that, oh, if you are same-sex attracted, there has to be something that's gone on in your background, right? There's something that's caused that. 
I believed that. I had a situation in my life that fed right into that. It was easy for me to believe there was not a good relationship with my dad. And so praise God that my mom and dad went with me. Praise God that when I went to my mom and told her that she never, ever turned her back. My father was angry, but he was mostly angry at himself, he would admit later. But we all three started going to this counselor. They drove down from Wichita Falls. I flew in from Lubbock. And we all started working on the three of us, right? And it was absolutely wonderful. We began to have conversations that we'd needed to have for 30 years and talk about things that had never been discussed before. It was wonderful. I began to experience a relationship with my father that I had never, ever seen before. Did things with my dad that I'd longed to do as a little girl, like going to the circus or going to a Cowboys football game, just the two of us. I asked him to read the Harry Potter series with me. Who in their late 30s reads the Harry Potter series, right? <laughs> Who in their 60s reads the Harry Potter series? <laughs> My daddy did. We read chapter by chapter, and we learned how to talk on the telephone he had never he had never called me on the phone. But he did, and we talked about that. We talked about that. There was such healing in our family, and yet, I was still gay. <laughs> And I am still gay. <laughs> I was always gay. It's taken me the next 20 years to figure out what to do with that. But I knew that there was too much, too much that was not being said, especially in my Christian world that we needed to open that conversation. And I just looked at that clock and I realized that I went on way too long. And so we're gonna speed through the next part of it. <laughs> but let me just tell you that that 20 year span is rich. It's rich and it's, it's a process, right? It's a process to move from believing that this is the worst absolute thing that can happen to someone being gay and to come to realize that God made me who I am and absolutely adores me as I am. And so, so does he love you. So almost three years ago to the day, Karen and I got married in Pecan Grove Park, not far from here, back in Rowlett. My father got to be with us. It was during the pandemic, and so sadly, Karen's family didn't get to come. We didn't get to have the church wedding that we wanted, but it was an absolutely beautiful, beautiful day. And if you'd told the little girl in that first picture that this day would ever come, she would wanted with all her heart to believe that. Already at eight years old, she did not believe that was possible. All things are possible. That is in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so long story, a little less long. Um, in 2006, uh, I worked with, well, from 2000 to 2006, I worked with a group of people uh, who knew that we needed to bring this conversation to light. And eventually it led to the nonprofit 501c3 organization of Centerpiece. 
You can go to our website at centerpeace.net and see all of these things. But that's how we got the conference last year at Wilshire. And there's a whole variety of things that we do because we're about creating, sorry about that, guys. Uh, we're about creating belonging for LGBTQ people. More literally, about building spiritual community for LGBTQ folk. That's exactly what you've done here. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. So one of the ways we do that is through tapestry retreats. They're small, intimate weekend retreats. We have one coming up in November in Tennessee. You can go to the website and read more. We do an event here, and actually they've sprouted all over the country. There are just dinners, and that's all it is. Because you may have friends who you want to ask to come to church and they wouldn't walk through that door if you offered them a million bucks. It's too painful. There's been too much wounding. But we'll come to dinner. We'll come to dinner. So October 3rd is our next just dinner. Y'all, do y'all know where it's going to be? Raymond, Don, Marissa? Okay. All right. Well, we'll have to find out and we'll announce it. Uh, Stories and Tunes, we did one last night. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful coffee shop over in Garland, Rosalind Coffee. We're going to start on the last Friday of the month, except for this month, and we're meeting October 20th. So put that on your calendar and come join us over there. Lots of online stuff that you can get involved with if you go to Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all the things. But we have a community of, of nearly 600 people over there. Uh, parent retreats. We do retreats for parents. We have one that's full in Arkansas coming up. Uh, there's a whole network thing that I could tell you about, but I won't because communion is more important. There's a course that will be available that you can take. Um, uh, my wife, Karen, teaches courses. Uh, her book, Scripture, Ethics, and the Possibility of Same-Sex Relationships, is the best thing that's out there on Scripture. I, I know I'm prejudiced, but <laughs> it's true. So you got your sticker, and, and there we have it. Here's where I want to leave you. What would happen if when people wanted to talk to LGBTQ folk about whether or not you can be gay or bisexual or lesbian or trans and Christian, the very first place we went to was Romans 8. Not Romans 1, but Romans 8, that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. That's the truth that we leave with. That's the truth that brings us all to the table.